Matching blood in today's sophisticated surgery can be very important. In open heart surgery, the blood used in the heart-lung machine must be perfectly matched with the blood of the patient. As many as a hundred separate laboratory blood tests may be necessary before the surgery is scheduled. And heart surgery is not the only medical emergency in which matching blood can be a matter of life or death. It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today, It Is Written presents Blood Type H. It was late in 1979, while on a trip into Mexico, that 13-year-old Efren de Loa became seriously ill. A local hospital treated his symptoms, but his condition didn't improve. The anxious family returned to their home in Richmond, California. Doctors at Oakland's Children's Hospital diagnosed Efren's disease as aplastic anemia, a rare disease that is sometimes fatal. The boy's best hope was a transplant of bone marrow from a compatible donor, preferably a close member of his family. While his parents and his seven brothers and sisters came in for blood and body tissue tests. Then came the surprise. Not only did their blood not match, the tests clearly revealed that Ephron was not even a biological member of the family. His mother realized immediately what had happened. She remembered clearly the day she brought Ephron home from the Mexicali hospital. Pastor Vanderman, I would like you to meet the Deloa family. This is Efren, his mother, Mrs. Deloa, and his brothers, Rafael and Eduardo. Mrs. Deloa delivered the baby 14 years ago at a Mexicali hospital. Right after delivery, she was taken to the register's office. At that time, a nurse placed her baby in a bassinet with another baby. Uh, they got exchanged, and Mrs. Deloa got the wrong baby. She didn't found, find out about it until 13 years later when Efren needed a bone marrow transplant. He came to Children's Hospital and with my help, we tried to locate the true biological parents. Um, a Mexicali newspaper placed several ads and articles describing the search. It was five days after these articles appeared that we were able to locate the true biological parents. The two mothers embraced, the father embraced the son he'd never seen. Now there was matching blood, and Ephraim had a new chance at life. How like our predicament, yours and mine. For you and I, along with everyone else on this planet, have contracted a disease that without a blood donor is always fatal. We call it sin. Its chief symptom, its most distressing symptom, is guilt. And the only cure for guilt is forgiveness. But, says the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 9, 22, this interesting book toward the close of the New Testament, Hebrews 9, 22. Listen, here it is. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. What is sin? Apostle John tells us in 1 John 3, 4, 1 John 3, 4, he says, sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the breaking of God's law. And what is the penalty for the breaking of God's law? The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Sin is so deadly, so destructive, so contrary to the great principle of love upon which the universe is founded, that the sinner must die, or somebody must die in his place. There's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Someone must die. 
If the sinner dies for his own sin, he has no hope and no future. A father had just tucked his little girl in bed. He wondered just how much a girl of her age could understand the story of Jesus. So he asked her this question. Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? She answered without hesitation, because the people have to be alive. Yes, the people who had sinned could pay for their own sins, but they wouldn't be alive, see. They could, uh, and how could the Creator be happy if the people He had made were not alive, you see? There was only one hope for the human race. Someone must die in our place. One man could take the place of only one man, and that was no solution. There were angels who offered to die for us, but that wouldn't solve the problem. An angel's life could only save one man, and millions and billions had sinned. The whole human race was guilty and was doomed. Only the life of the Creator, because He was the Creator, could be equal to the life of all He'd created. You see, the Son of God, our Creator, could take our place if He would, and He offered to do just that. Have you ever wondered why Jesus, somewhere in heaven, simply didn't place himself on an altar and give his life, and then send angels to bring the good news of what he'd done? Oh, friend, it was more complicated than that. The mystery of God's plan to save us is beyond our comprehension. Though it will be our study throughout all eternity, we do not understand the incarnation, the mysterious blend of the divine and the human that made Jesus a perfect Savior. I say we don't completely understand it, but we do know this, that our Savior must be God. He must be also man. The blood that He shed for us must be matching blood. It must be blood type H, H for human. Listen, listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Here it is. Look, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, see, human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Think of it. He willingly exchanged the throne of heaven for a manger. He lived as we must live, but without sin without even a trace of its contamination. Says the Apostle Paul in Hebrews 4.15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Yes, Jesus is the Son of Mary, was in some mysterious way both the Son of God and the Son of Adam. Jesus let blood like yours and mine, human blood, course through his veins so that he could know what it's like to be human, to be lonely, to be tempted. He was tempted in the wilderness where he was hungry and alone to turn stones into bread. But he wouldn't do it because we couldn't, see? He was tempted that night in Gethsemane's garden to free himself from his enemies. But, and he could have, but he wouldn't, because we couldn't. He didn't have to die, but he did die. He didn't try to escape it or exempt himself from it. He died the death we have to die if he didn't. You see, his blood matched ours, the blood from his veins, and his hands and from his side, the blood, you see, is the life. Our life was in his veins so that his life could be ours, in ours. He had no sin. He was without fault. But what did he do? 
Listen, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 24, all those scriptures are magnificent today. They always are. But listen to this. Listen to this. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. By his wounds, you have been healed. Don't these scriptures take on new meaning? Wonderful provision. He who made us, he who made us became like us so that he could save us. Isn't that wonderful? And did you know that Jesus carried his perfect humanity back to the courts of heaven forever to be identified with the human race? God did not simply lend us his only son for 33 years. He gave him to us forever. Can you understand it? I can't. Matching blood. No forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Forgiveness is the costliest thing in the universe. It cost the lifeblood of the Son of God. But there's still more. The gospel provision doesn't stop with forgiveness. Forgiveness isn't enough, wonderful as it is, if we have no power to stop sinning, you see. Our hearts are contaminated beyond repair. We need new hearts. Did you know that God has new hearts for us? He will accept them. Heart transplants for us all. Listen, tells us all about it right here. The book is up to date. Ezekiel 36, verse 26. Ezekiel 36, 26 tells us about the heart transplants. Listen, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What do you think of that? A heart transplant. Dan Craner, 18 years old, had only one wish for Christmas, 1980, a new heart. Without it, doctors gave him less than a year to live. That's right, Pastor Vanderman. After an evaluation at Stanford, I was put on a waiting list. I was gonna be a heart transplant recipient. Well, a few weeks passed and no heart came in. I wanted to go home for Christmas. It was near Christmas and I'd been home to Napa or been with my friends and so I asked him if I could go home. He said, well, what we'll do is we'll send you to the apartment where your parents are staying. My parents are staying in an apartment near the hospital to be with me. And so I went over there for a couple days to see how I did as an outpatient and no phone calls came in. So we packed up, we'd left home for Napa and five minutes after we left, the phone rang and the heart came in. But we had already left home for Napa. And so the California Highway Patrol was alerted. They looked for us on the freeways and they just couldn't find us. We got all the way home to Napa. We pulled up in our driveway and my grandmother had been staying at my house, come running out and said, go back, your heart has come in. I said, oh no, there goes Christmas. And so then the California Highway Patrol rolled up and they said, you have to be back at 4.30. It was 10 minutes after three. We couldn't make it by car. And so a chartered plane was waiting for us at the Napa County Airport. And that's uh, 15 minutes from my home. So we went to the Napa County Airport and got on a plane there and flew off to Palo Alto. That's two hours away from Napa. And so we got all the way to Palo Alto and there was an ambulance waiting there. And time was running out. We didn't know if we were gonna make it on time to get that heart I needed. And would you believe it? It was 425, just five minutes more and Dan would have lost his chance for a new heart. It would have gone to somebody else. That's the way it is with the new heart that God has for you. Time is a factor, and time is running out. Time will not go on forever. The new heart will have to go to someone else if you do not claim it in time. God is trying to find you. He's enlisted his agents to help on the search, to intercept you somewhere on life's journey, to get you to turn back. He wants you to know that you don't have to despair. Life is waiting. You're at the top of the list, but there's so little time. Friends have given money to It Is Written so that we could join in the search, so that we could bring you the good news that you're, and friends, you're hearing it now. Well, a moving little story comes out of Saudi Arabia, where the Loma Linda University Heart Team, my friends personally, had traveled to take heart surgery to those who could not be brought to the United States. Loma Linda, as you probably know by now, is a Seventh-day Adventist medical 
University and Medical School in Southern California. One of those selected for heart surgery on this visit was Wafa, a young Saudi Arabian girl, just 18. She was a beautiful young woman, always smiling, but she had had a troubled life. At 17, she'd been widowed. And those who knew the culture said that she'd probably never marry again. This seems such a shame. On Friday, the Muslim holy day, Khalid, the respiratory therapist, came back from prayer to the mosque to give breathing treatments to the patients. A member of the heart team asked if he'd seen the young woman scheduled for surgery on the weekend. He had not. But he walked by Watha's room and kept carefully glanced in. Khalid was interested. He talked at length with the American nurse, telling her about his culture and his religion explaining that the Quran forbids any socialization between men and women outside the home. But he followed every detail of Wather's case, was happy to give a unit of his blood for such a special person. On Saturday night, he came to the hospital to give Wather her preoperative breathing instructions. Instead of his lab coat, he was wearing the typical Arab dress and he looked handsome enough to make any girl's heart skip. He didn't miss a point in his instruction. He showed her how to cough and breathe deeply and how to breathe on the respir respirator. He explained all of the equipment that she would see when she woke up. Then he told her that he'd be praying for her, would be with her in surgery. Well, the first two days after surgery, her blood pressure was low and she required respiratory assistance. Then she began to improve. She had the clearest lungs of any patient in the hospital. Whether she needed it or not, you see, colleague continued giving her instructions. And part of her therapy was walking. And that gave colleague a plausible excuse, excuse to be with her alone, for he was her therapist. And on one of these walks, he came right to the point. If some representative of his family approached her father, would she marry him? Her smile told him all that he needed to know. Well, the story doesn't have the happiest of endings, however. For Watha then learned from her mother that her father, only two months before, had promised her to a cousin. And colleague, though deeply disappointed, said simply, God's will be done. God must have some other plan for my life. Friend, for 33 years, Jesus walked among his people, healing the sick, relieving the captives, comforting the brokenhearted, drying their tears with his smile of understanding. And still today, he walks unseen among us. Wherever there's loneliness, wherever there are tears, wherever there are wounds that need his healing touch, but he wants to be our savior as well as our healer. And if you listen closely, you'll hear him come right to the point, asking for your heart. What will your answer be? Don't disappoint him, my friend. Listen to this. There is your burden of sin. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power 
much whiter than snow. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are gone in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful Thank you, Marilyn. Shall we pray? Father mine, we understand a little better now the terrific cost of our redemption. And what can we say but thank you? Yet how do we say thank you to you, dear God? Surely the best way to say it, the most understandable way to say it, the way you long to hear it is simply, I accept the new heart that you've so freely given me. Its rejection can only come from us, and surely this is unthinkable. Help every viewer just now to take full advantage of the offer before the new heart goes to someone else. In Jesus' name we plead, amen. I'm Roland Lenhoff. In a moment, our prayer alert feature for today. But first, would you like to have a relationship with your Lord so spontaneous, so natural, and so appealing that others will see a remarkable change in you? Have you decided today to make the finding of such a relationship your first priority? Write and tell us, won't you? We'd love to hear from you. Whoever you are, whether or not you are a new Christian, we have a gift for you. It's Pastor Vanderman's interesting book, How to Live with a Tiger. This is a book that will tell you how to become a Christian. In a moment, we will tell you how to ask for your personal copy. This is one of the most practical books you will ever read. Ask for the book by name, How to Live with a Tiger, and we'll get it right into the mail. And now here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, and the zip is 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name, and we'll put it into the mail right away. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week at this same time on this station. Thank you for your letters, your prayer requests, and your liberal support, which is so necessary in a television ministry like It Is Written. The address again is George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, and the zip is 91360. Thanks, Roland. And here's our prayer alert feature for today. Today we're in Napa, California. In a moment, we're going to discover how God answers prayer through the highway patrol, an airplane, and an ambulance. That's today on Prayer Alert. Joining hands across the miles, it is written, Family of Prayer and Circle of Caring. Prayer Alert. I'm sitting with Dan Cranert in the living room of his home. Earlier on this telecast, you heard Dan tell how the highway patrol, airplane, and ambulance got him to the medical center just in time to receive a new heart. 
But Dan, in those days before you received the heart transplant, when no heart was available, what was going through your mind? Well, I knew in my spiritual heart that God was almighty and could do all things. So I prayed. I asked God if it was His will to open those doors and let it happen. If it wasn't, to close them. And on December 22nd, 1980, I received my new heart. God answered my prayer. Now, Dan, before this, did you have a relationship with Christ and an experience with prayer? Well, yeah, I became a Christian just before I became ill. I had six heart failures and two cardiac arrests before I even made it to the operating table for my heart transplant. That depended on ministries such as It Is Written with George Vanderman to keep me spiritually strong while I was in the hospital. Well, we're glad to know that It Is Written was of help to you at that time. Now tell me, Dan, uh, do you have any idea whose heart you received? It was a 19-year-old Marine out of Camp Pendleton in San Diego. He died in a motorcycle accident. He had a utility pole and that was it for him. He died and I received his heart. Was there anything about this that impressed you personally? Yeah, there's a proverb, uh, 27 one, it says, do not boast about tomorrow because you don't know what a day will bring forth. And well, a lot of people take life for granted, especially younger people. They think they're gonna be here tomorrow. And well, we just don't know, like this Marine didn't know. And so we have to be ready to meet the Lord at all times. Now, in light of all of this that has happened, Dan, uh, what are your pl plans for the present and the future? I think I might like to be a youth pastor or an evangelist or even make a living giving my testimony. If that helps, well, then go to school. Well, Dan, it's certainly wonderful to hear how God has worked in your life. I'm sure that there are others who are watching today who have also had experiences of God working in a miraculous way in your experience. And uh, you want to write and tell us about that. There may be some who would like to become partners with us in prayer. Let us know that also. For all who write to us this week, we are going to send you Pastor Vandeman's book, which is entitled Unlocking Heaven's Storehouse, a very practical book on prayer that will help you in your relationship with Christ. Write to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. That's George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. And now back to Pastor Vandeman. And now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Roland Lenhoff again next Sunday, Easter Sunday, April 3, an encore presentation of the world-famous Oberammergau Passion Play. You'll meet the man who portrays Christ and see highlights of the most recent performance, including the emotion-filled Last Supper. That's next week, the Oberammergau Easter Special.